Welcome to the Fairwinds Energy Education Podcast for Thursday, August 1st. Today's podcast is accompanied by a video portion which can be linked to through our webpage. So hopefully you'll take a moment and check it out. Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds Energy Education. In the last year and a half, I've been around the world a couple times. I've been to Japan twice for a period of two weeks, um, to Italy, and of course repeatedly to Washington, D.C. to talk to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Most recently, I was invited to go right outside of Toronto in Canada and uh, discuss the Canadian nuclear design. You know, you can have 40 good years and one bad day. And that's really what I was trying to tell the Canadian regulators when I was, when I was near Toronto. There's a couple takeaways from the presentation that follows, which is my speech to the regulators that I'd like you to think about. The first is, you know, as I travel around the world, I hear people say, well, the people who run my nuclear plant are, are smarter or are nice people. And an accident couldn't happen to mine because these people are so safety conscious. And really what I was able to tell the Canadian regulators is that that's a false argument. Now, I knew the operators at, at Three Mile Island. They were nice. They were safety conscious. They were smart. And still an accident can happen. So as I've been saying, you can have 40 good years and one bad day with this technology. And it's not about having nice people running the nuclear reactor. It's a technology that can have that one bad day. And I hope that one bad day is not in your backyard. The other things I was able to tell the Canadian regulators was the containment systems at, um, at Pickering are nowhere near as strong as the ones that blew up at Fukushima Daiichi. And the interesting thing in this dialogue was that they agreed. So we now know that the position of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Board is that the nuclear reactors are not as, um, as well contained as those that blew up at Fukushima Daiichi. And the last piece was the emergency planning. The, uh, the, the reactors at Pickering are about uh, 20 miles from the outskirts of Toronto. Toronto's got 4 million people. And it's a two-hour drive down to Buffalo, New York. So we've got eight nuclear reactors within 20 miles of 4 million people. How are we ever going to do an emergency evacuation of 4 million people? So what follows is that presentation. But what I wanted to mention to, before we go over to my presentation at the Pickering units is that this kind of analysis that Fairwinds is known for, very factual and um, certainly counter to what the nuclear industry would like to, uh, to, to publicize, is that our analysis requires money. Now, Maggie and I do these videos for free, but we have a team, a production team, that can't do that. And so we're asking you to donate today, and we're asking you to spread the word about the Fukushima Daiichi accident through referring people to our website. Thank you very much, and I hope you hit the donate button. MD-13H 2.133, and I understand that uh, Mr. Gunderson will make the presentation. Please proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, bonjour. Um, my name is Arnie Gunderson, spelled S-E-N. Um, I'm a chief engineer at Fairwinds. There's an E in the middle of that. And I come to you from uh, Burlington, Vermont. The uh, closest nuclear plant to my house is the uh, recently uh, shut down Candu uh, reactor uh, in Quebec. The, um, um, I, I, am, I am here uh, uh, because of your program that allows uh, experts to be um, uh, your public um, participation funding. And I, um, I, I deeply appreciate that. That's entirely different than in the United States. Um, also, this, uh, the, the give and take in these hearings is entirely different in, in the United States. I, I recently spoke to the Atomic, um, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and um, there I spoke, they said thank you, and there was no dialogue. So I, I appreciate the public funding and the and the fact that there there is a dialogue. The um, um, I, I've heard today uh, and yesterday um, many people talk about the um, uh, the integrity of the staff, how well they're wonderful neighbors, and how they contribute to the community. Um, 
I submit to you that that's not why you're here today. Um, I personally knew the reactor operators at Three Mile Island. I had, uh, I was a senior vice president in the nuclear industry, a bachelor's and master's in nuclear and an operator's license. But I, I had people on my staff working at Three Mile Island, and I got to know the, the people who worked there. They were wonderful. Their kids played soccer. They went to church, and they were, um, they, they were people of high integrity. Um, later, I got to know the operators at, uh, at Chernobyl. And again, their, their families lived in the area and, and uh, people of high integrity and a, a great safety ethic. Um, I've written a book which is a, a bestseller in Japan uh, called Fukushima Daiichi, the, uh, the Truth and the Way Forward. And uh, I've gotten to know many uh, uh, Japanese operators as well. And again, um, excellent engineers who knew their thermo and loved their thermo and, um, uh, and, and men and women of integrity. And, and a corporation in Tokyo Electric that uh, uh, lavished funds on their communities as well. So it's not about um, the integrity of the corporation or how, how smart the, uh, the individuals are who, um, who work there. We're talking about a technology that can have 40 great years and one bad day. And I submit to you that that's why you're here, is to make sure that we don't have one bad day um, on the um, on the Pickering reactors, the um, uh, the Pickering design is as old as Fukushima Daiichi Unit One. Um, Daiichi Unit One started in 1971. Um, it was designed in the 60s, constructed in the late 60s, and, and and went online. It had just received its license extension uh, to operate an extra 10 years. Uh, it hit its 40th year one month before it blew itself to smithereens. Um, Daiichi 1's failure was different than Daiichi uh, 2 and 3. Um, they, they all um, experienced uh, the unexpected, but Daiichi 1 failed first because of age-related problems in its design. So there are uh, more similarities to the, um, the Fukushima Daiichi 1 than, uh, to Pickering than, uh, uh, than, than Daiichi 2 and 3. The, um, uh, you know, I studied, uh, I got my bachelor's and master's in, in the late 60s, early 70s, and, and, and I, I studied the, the can-do design, and, and it was, um, uh, it was a, at the time, there were many, many alternative reactor designs out there, and it was certainly a design um, worth pursuing. It was, it was clever with the online refueling, the natural uranium, the, deplete, the, 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 the uh, deuterium fuel. Um, but, but history has shown that it is not as reliable as other units because of its complexity. All these pressure tubes and the, um, and the problems associated with it over time have, have left the can-do design uh, behind. Uh, it, it effectively is an evolutionary dead end, almost like um, uh, uh, in, in, in Europe we had Neanderthals that eventually uh, disappeared, although they, they mingled with the, the, um, um, the people um, who, who did survive. Well, the, the can-do design is very much like that. There have been no, um, uh, worldwide, that less than 10% of the nuclear reactors are, um, are the can-do design, and those are predominantly in Canada and in India, and the Indians started with the Kandu design to build bombs. So uh, if, you, if you separate those two uh, countries out worldwide, there's only about 3% of the plants in the country, in the world, are, are of the Kandu design. And no new reactors have been ordered of the, of the more modern Kandu design. So we're dealing with a, um, a technology that was well worth trying, um, but is but proving itself to be uh, a, 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 an engineering evolutionary uh, dead end. Um, and I'd like to talk uh, about the two problems, to, how to avoid that one bad day. Um, and, and it boils down to two areas. The first area is the um, um, aging, and the second area is the unexpected. Um, the aging issue um, has to go to the, the uh, um, probabilistic risk assessment, which we talked about earlier. But it also uh, has to talk about, in a perfect world, um, a lot of the calculations you've heard uh, before are, in fact, true. Um, but you, you must remember that, that, that at Bruce, 
um, a pressure tube failed after seven years. It didn't get to, to uh, 200,000 hours. It failed after seven years. There was an unanticipated pressure transient that caused that tube to fail. Um, at, at, we, we heard yesterday that the tubes grow um, because of the neutron fluence, and they're locked at one end, and they grow one way, and then uh, halfway through the cycle, they're locked at the other end, and they grow back the other way. Um, well, at, at Darlington, um, they discovered that seven tubes were locked at both ends. Um, in a perfect world, that doesn't happen, but in reality, it does. The, um, uh, Darlington then went and took a look at other, the, the other reactors and found that, that each reactor had three tubes that were locked on both ends. The net effect of that is that it, it, it introduces stresses that aren't anticipated in the, uh, in the presentations you've heard earlier. So in a perfect world, um, these tubes might go beyond um, 210,000 uh, effective full power hours, uh, but in fact, there are operational transients that can cause them to fail if they exceed that uh, 210,000 hour, um, hour limit. Um, one of the problems is the, uh, is the inspections, and you mentioned that the, uh, uh, how many tubes are inspected, and it's somewhere between 20 and 30 tubes uh, per outage out of almost 400, so we're looking at 5 to 8 percent of the, of the tubes are inspected. In order to do that inspection, all the fuel must be pushed out of the tube and it can't be put back in, which is one of the reasons that the, the can-do design is so expensive. You're essentially throwing away um, a year and a half worth of good fuel uh, in, in each of the tubes that you plan to, uh, to inspect. Well, that does two things. It causes the tube to vibrate uh, because it's lighter. And, uh, and it also, when you start back up, you fill that tube with new fuel which changes the neutron fluence. Um, it's, not, um, it's not like the tubes around it anymore. When the tube is accessible, a, a very small scraping of the material is made and analyzed to determine the, uh, um, how much hydrogen is in the fuel. But it is a very small sample, um, and um, in my opinion, it's a frighteningly small sample. This issue of probabilistic risk assessment is driven um, by statistics. And when you're the oldest unit on the block, as, as Pickering is, all of the data which you're basing your decision on moving forward is based on newer units. Now, I'm 64 years old, and if I go to my doctor and say, what's going to kill me? She's going to look at people that are 50 to 80 and say, you know, cancer and heart attacks are in your age group. Well, Pickering is at the end of the age group. My doctor doesn't look at me and, and go back in time and say, well, you know, 10-year-olds fall off of tricycles a lot. But that's really what we're looking at. We're looking at, old, we're looking at the oldest unit making its probabilistic risk assessment moving forward on data from the youngest unit. The oldest operating plant today is about 46 years old. So there's not a lot of probabilistic data out there to defend a case that, that things are going to uh, be okay moving forward. Um, at the Big Rock Point plant in, um, in the States, um, it, was, it was shut down, small reactor, about 200 megawatts, and uh, it had a system like um, um, we have here at the Kandu reactors where boron was, could be rapidly injected into the uh, core to shut it down. The Kandu design has this prompt void coefficient, which uh, uh, to my knowledge, not many reactors around the world have. But anyway, Big Rock had this design to rapidly inject boron. And when the plant was being dismantled, um, the, the engineers discovered that the pipe had been plugged for eight years and would never have worked. So in a perfect world, all these numbers, um, all these numbers jive. But in fact, in, in reality, things break for unexpected reasons. There's two numbers in my report, and uh, only two, uh, mercifully, that I'd like to bring to your attention. On page 10 of the expert report I, I put together, um, the, um, uh, the, the, what, what has been bantered about is a high degree of confidence um, has been mentioned periodically. Well, that's defined in one of the reports that I reference in, in my expert report, at the top of page 10. A high degree of confidence is, is in excess of 70% sure. I teach math at the local 
uh, at the local university in Burlington, and, and 70 is just barely passing. But that's defined as a high degree of confidence. Um, the other number is on page 13, which is, in my opinion, the most disturbing number using probabilistic risk assessment. Um, the, um, the, the large release frequency um, for, um, uh, for the, the Pickering units is within 20% of the, uh, of the safety limit. It's 8e to the minus 6 is, is what's calculated, and the safety limit is 1e to the, uh, e to the minus 5. Uh, I noticed the report I took this from called 1e uh, to the minus 5 the safety limit. Uh, the slide was changed yesterday, and it was called a safety goal. Uh, to my mind, a limit is, is uh, something that it's intolerable. And um, using these favorable assumptions, um, the, um, uh, the, the probabilities are extraordinarily close to the, uh, uh, to the limit. The, uh, the other piece of uh, the bad day, if you will, is uh, to expect the uh, unexpected. Um, as I said, I've, I've studied, uh, I've been to Japan twice in the, last, in the last year and have studied the accident extensively. Um, and um, um, the accident at uh, Fukushima Daiichi was not caused by a, by a tidal wave. That was, that was the uh, incipient thing. But what happened was the, there was something called a loop, loss of off-site power, um, followed by a, um, uh, something called a Lewis, L-O-U-H-S, loss of the ultimate heat sink. And that caused the station blackout. And without electricity, the plant could not be cooled. Um, the plant would have failed anyway, even if the diesels had not been destroyed because the water source at the, at the edge of the ocean was destroyed. There are numerous ways to cause the loss of the ultimate heat sink. That's the ultimate heat sink. In your case, the lake at, at Daiichi, it was the, uh, it was the ocean. Um, and um, uh, all of which will lead to the same type of accident that we had at, uh, at Fukushima Daiichi. The Pickering units are quite similar to Daiichi in that you can have multi-unit problems. We had one unit explode at Daiichi, and it, and it damaged the units on either side of it. Um, they topple like dominoes. The, uh, the vacuum building at Pickering is a single building designed for a single accident. If you have a multi-unit accident, uh, the lessons from Fukushima Daiichi show you can have a multi-unit accident. You only have one vacuum building. Um, and last but not least is the nearness to a major population center. I've been at 70 nuclear reactors around the country uh, and around the world. And um, um, the Indian Point is uh, 40 kilometers from the outskirts of New York City. Um, that's about the nearest similarity. And, and you're 30 kilometers from the center of Toronto. Um, the emergency planning here, like in Japan, uh, is a significant problem. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video and listening to this podcast. I just want to remind people that as Fairwinds continues to try to prevent that one bad day in your backyard, we can't do it without your help. We need your emotional support. We need you to pass along our message. And we need your financial support as well. We cannot continue to produce this kind of work without your help. Please help us make this world a better place for our children, for our grandchildren, and for everyone.